Welcome to Heart to Heart with Anna, featuring your host, Anna Jaworski. Our program is designed to empower the CHD or congenital heart defect community. Our program may also help families who have children who are chronically ill by bringing information and encouragement to you in order to become an advocate for your community. Now, here is Anna Jaworski. Welcome to the 10th season of Heart to Heart with Anna. Our theme this season is Education for Heart Warriors, and we have a great show for you. Today's show is Special Education Accommodations and Individualized Health Care Plans. Lisa O'Connor is our special guest. Lisa is a special education advocate who has been working with special needs families for over a decade. She is a special education surrogate parent, or SESP, representing students in state custody and serves on two school boards. Lisa lives with her husband and two children in Groveland, Massachusetts. Lisa learned long ago how important it was to share her knowledge and life experiences to help other families navigate the special education process. In 2016, Lisa was a Federation of Special Needs Parent Advocacy Award recipient. She has spoken before various groups, was a guest speaker on radio talk shows, and has her own Facebook page called Special Education Collaborative Consulting, which is a resource for families. Lisa finds it very rewarding when parents and schools can work together as a team for the success of a child, as all children deserve to reach their full potential. Welcome back to Heart to Heart with Annalisa. My longtime listeners may remember you from season one when you talked about learning disabilities and possible brain injury, or from season two when you talked about bullying and making schools safe. Thank you for having me here again, Anna. It's always a pleasure to share my knowledge with our Heart Warrior families, and this is the perfect time of year to be reviewing school accommodations. I know. I was thinking about that, too. I thought, wow, parents are just now gearing up for their kids to go back to school This is the time to dust everything off, (laughs) take a look at it again, and see what it is that maybe needs to be changed or adjusted a little bit. Yes. Talk to me about how long you've been a special education advocate and what kind of training you had to become the advocate you are. Well, I've been an advocate for over a decade, and I've helped families from coast to coast. There was a family in Florida and another family in California that contacted me and I was able to attend their meetings via telephone. And I was trained through the Federation of Special Needs out of Boston, Massachusetts. It was an intensive course. It was actually two different courses that I took. That's great. It sounds like you have a lot of experience. Having done this for over a decade, I imagine you've seen all different kinds of children with all different kinds of needs. Yes, I have. There's a lot of different disabilities out there and everybody needs the most individualized education plan to assist them. Right, and with our heart warriors, it's not just the heart defect that affects a lot of our kids. A lot of our students also have autism or dyslexia or ADHD, so there are a lot of different needs to be considered. Now, parents are required to go to meetings for their children if they are receiving special services, but so many parents, Lisa, feel intimidated sitting in a room full of professionals. So what is a special education advocate, and how can an advocate help parents? Well, I'm a firm believer, number one, that everybody needs to collaborate to be successful. Mm -hmm. You don't want to go to the table and not be willing to collaborate with the team. And parents are equal team players in the IEP process and the team process. Right. So the role of the special education advocate is they will come in and they will teach the parent how to best advocate for their child because the parent is the child's best advocate. Mm -hmm. And the advocate is most familiar with the laws in, in any particular state and makes sure that the laws are followed so that the child's educational needs are met. Mm -hmm. The advocate is there to help teach the parent how to best advocate. Right. Okay. Does it cost money to have an advocate? And where would parents find a listing of advocates who could help them? There's a wide range of different kinds of advocates. So number one, parents need to be familiar with their child and to best look for an advocate that matches their child's needs. Some advocates work pro bono and other advocates might charge an hourly fee while some charge retainers or a set price to do a particular job, maybe to either attend a meeting or review an IEP or evaluations. So the best way for a parent to find an advocate is to either ask their doctors, whether it's a pediatrician or cardiologist, to tap into other parent groups. There's always a lot of groups that parents can find online through Facebook or maybe 
their local hospitals. There's always parent support groups, and mm-hmm. it's going to be parents in those support groups that have had advocates in their areas, and they can always do a search online. But the most important question for parents to ask an advocate during the interview process is what kinds of areas those advocates specialize in. Because if you have a child with cardiac issues, you want to find an advocate that knows how to advocate for a child with medical needs. Right, right, exactly. That's an excellent point. Now, you said you have a Facebook page. Is there a listing of advocates on your Facebook page, or is that just dedicated to your own business? This is just my own business, and my page just has various links to helpful websites, whether your child has medical needs, dyslexia, Mm -hmm. autism, executive functioning, things like that. And I also offer weekly special education tips for parents. Oh, that's awesome. You had said that you've helped people all the way from Florida to California and, of course, I'm sure a lot of Massachusetts. And you also referenced that the laws can be different. There are national laws in the United States that do protect our children, but the laws do vary from state to state. How important is it to find an advocate who's located in your state, Lisa? Well, it's important to find an advocate in your own state, but... A good advocate is also very familiar with federal laws, Mm -hmm. so therefore they can cross over borders. I'm very close to the New Hampshire border, so I've also represented New Hampshire families as well because the law is pretty much the same, at least up in New England. Okay. Okay. Yeah, it's interesting now because I had Marie O'Donnell on the show earlier this season, and she lives in one state, but she works in another, and she was telling me how she was surprised to find that some of the regulations were different just between those two states, even though they are neighboring states. So it is important to make sure that your advocate knows what the regulations and rules are for your state. And to also be aware, friends, that things can change school to school, even inside the same state. So you need to be familiar with how your school handles certain accommodations. Wouldn't that be true, Lisa? I think it might vary from elementary to high school, it Mm -hmm. would vary. Mm -hmm. But but if you have a school district that has, say, four different elementary schools, they should all be operating the same way. Okay, good. That's good to know. Because they should all be under the same leadership with the same administration and all receive the same training. Great. Okay, well, we need to take a quick commercial break. Don't leave yet. Coming up next, we're going to talk to Lisa about what kind of resources schools can provide for children with special needs when we return to Heart to Heart with Anna. The most common theme that I hear is why. She always needed um, a lot of attention. She had strokes. Even though it's a natural inclination to withdraw from the CHD community, I think being a part of it to help me be part of the solution. Heart to Heart with Michael. Please join us every Thursday at noon Eastern. I'm Michael Lieben, and I'll be your host as we talk with people from around the world who have experienced those most difficult moments. Forever by the Baby Blue Sound Collective. I think what I love so much about this CD is that some of the songs were inspired by the patients. Many listeners will understand many of the different songs and what they've been inspired by. Our new album will be available on iTunes, Amazon.com, Spotify. I love the fact that the proceeds from this CD are actually going to help those with congenital heart defects. Enjoy the music. Home tonight forever. Welcome back to our show, Heart to Heart with Anna, a show for the congenital heart defect community. Today's show is Special Education Accommodations and Individualized Healthcare Plans. We're here with Lisa O'Connor talking about how to get necessary services for special needs students. What are the most common needs an elementary-aged heart warrior might have, Lisa, and what are some accommodations they may need to help them be successful in school? Well, the most common disabilities a student might have. It doesn't necessarily have to be linked to a heart warrior, but sometimes they found that heart warriors do have disabilities. There's learning disabilities, ADHD, autism spectrum disorder, and executive functioning are the most common. Mm -hmm. So some of the more common accommodations for a child with a learning disability, elementary age, would be a list of word walls, they call them, which is common words that students use that the kids can reference, more time on tests and assignments, 
fewer problems on tests and assignments, being graded on content but not penmanship or grammar for students that might have OT issues. Right. Instead of reading books, have audio books or books on tape mm -hmm. and math reference sheets. Mm -hmm. Students that have ADHD, some common accommodations are motor breaks, which could be as simple as sharpening pencils or making trips to the, down to the office with attendance sheets. Mm -hmm. Fidgets mm -hmm. are always good to keep children's hands busy. Gentle focusing reminders and cues or preferential seating to eliminate any distractions in a classroom. Right. Some common accommodations for children with autism spectrum disorder might be a social skills group, being moved away from uh, noises, mm -hmm. able to stand up in the back of the classroom when they need to mm -hmm. uh, during content time, and an assigned buddy or have friend matching. Right. And some common accommodations for a child with executive functioning at an elementary level might be to have an inverted box cover used as a desk drawer colored coded notebooks, folders, and binders to help with organization, and teacher assistance to purge papers and weekly desk cleanouts. Right. All of those are really important. I know that with some of the special needs students that I've worked with in the elementary age, we sometimes in Texas have study carols. Do you know what I'm talking about, Lisa? It's like a tri-board. It's a three-sided right. board that they can right. put up and maybe in a table in the back of the classroom so it blocks everything out. Right. However, if you have a child that likes to talk out loud, talk through a problem, that doesn't always work. So then a child might need to have separate seating in a different room if they use a talk out loud method. Yeah. And this is what is so important that we're talking about right now is that every child has his or her own unique needs. With the one student, well, actually with several students that I've worked with, having that study carol enabled them to block out what the other students were doing when they were taking tests or when they were working on something, you know, serious project that required their focus. But like you said, you can't sit behind that the entire time. <laughs> so that was all like, you know, during testing needs or when they were working on special projects. And I think it's really important, like you said, for the parents to be in communication with the teachers. The parents are one of the most important elements of the team for that student to be successful. And sometimes their needs change, even in the course of a year. Don't you think, Lisa? They absolutely can. In order for a child to be eligible for 504 or, you know, especially an IEP, testing needs to happen. So mm -hmm. it's always advantageous that if a parent feels that the child's not making effective progress, that they request the school to do formal evaluations in all areas of potential disability. And then a meeting will be held to find out if the child is eligible for either a 504, which is simply accommodations, or an IEP, which is accommodations and annual measurable goals. And another important piece that children, especially with medical needs, should have is an individualized health care plan which is medical accommodations, right. and that could either be attached to a 504 or an IEP. Right, and we'll be talking about that later in the show, folks, so stay tuned for that. We'll be talking about that in the next segment. But let's talk a little bit more about how our children's needs change as they age, Lisa. I mean, especially when our kids get into middle school. What can schools do to help our middle school-aged heart warriors be successful? Well, again, it's pretty much the same accommodations that I listed for elementary school students, mm -hmm. but some of those maybe aren't needed anymore, so mm -hmm. you might not need a word wall anymore, or maybe gentle focusing reminders to stay on task, or maybe a social skills group might not be needed anymore. Mm -hmm. But there mm -hmm. are more appropriate things where, number one, you want the child to be able to communicate their needs when they're in middle school, and, and there's more room to teach self-advocacy skills. Right. And you also mm -hmm. want to start preparing them for high school, which is much more independent. Right. So at a middle school level, they could always be given accommodations to have agenda books for homework assignments, mm. long-term projects. Again, color-coded binders, notebooks, and folders for organization. Motor breaks are typically worked into the school day, so you really don't need motor breaks accommodations. Right, because they move from class to class. So. They move from class, mm -hmm. yeah. And then clean copies of notes, mm -hmm. able to use assistive devices such as laptops or iPads to take notes, audio books, testing in a separate room. Again, preferential seating is important. Mm -hmm. Allowed more time to get to classes, maybe leave a class a little bit early to get to the next class if they have some PT issues. Mm -hmm. It's always good to have a second copy of curriculum books kept at home. 
Yeah. Rest is the one, you know, so you're not carrying heavy books back and forth right. to school. You can have one set in school, another set at home. Yeah. Especially since we're finding out that so many of our heart warriors have scoliosis. And so right. carrying those heavy backpacks is just really not good for our kids. It's ideal when you have a school that provides iPads to all the students. Yeah. But that's just not always the case due to budget right. concerns. So right. having a second set of curriculum books at home is always helpful. Mm-hmm. And again, teacher assistance when purging papers because you don't need to carry around every paper in your backpack <laughs> that you've received since the start of the school year. Right. And again, at that point, there's more state-mandated testing being done in mm-hmm. schools. So mm-hmm. you want to make sure that any classroom accommodations that you have can also be used for state-mandated testing. Oh, that's really good. So if a child has moved outside of the classroom to have a regular exam, mm-hmm. that they're also moved outside of the classroom during a state-mandated exam. Right, right. And maybe if it's mandated that they also get extra time. All of that is just so important. Yes, that's excellent. All excellent advice. As we've been talking about, Lisa, our students' needs can change over time, and we certainly see a big change from elementary to middle school age, but I've seen an even bigger difference in what's expected of children when they go from middle school to high school. So can you talk to us about some of the changes that happen to our heart warriors as they enter those high school years? So some of the accommodations, again, are going to stay the same, and some of them are going to either be eliminated or they're going to become updated because you really want the child to go from needing assistance to being fully independent. Mm -hmm. So you always want all of your IEP accommodations and goals and 504 accommodations to always move towards independency. You want the student to be able to self-advocate for their needs and preparing them for adulthood. To that end, Lisa, do you, as an advocate, encourage the student to be part of their annual meetings? When a child turns 14 and they're on an IEP, they're supposed to be part of their IEP meetings Mm -hmm. and they have a vision. So the student's vision is then taken into consideration when developing an IEP for a high school student. Also, when a student turns 14, there has to be a transition assessment completed, hopefully completed by a transition specialist if the school district can find somebody to do that. And the transition assessment fine-tunes what the child is going to need to become an independent adult, whether they want to work full-time or go to college full-time or go to a technical college. Okay. There also should be an assistive technology evaluation done which fine-tunes what the student is going to need to be successful in high school and onwards into college. So at that point, during the later years of high school, the team starts looking at all of the accommodations that are in place to see which ones are more appropriate for college and starts dropping off the ones that were probably more appropriate for, for middle school and high school. Okay. And if a neuropsych was done in the elementary school years, the neuropsych should always be repeated in the ninth or 10th grade so that the rest of the high school years are all appropriately written, you know, the IEPs are written to address whatever's left in the neuropsych that has to be taken care of. And again, physical education becomes a much more important concern when children are in high school Mm -hmm. because at that point sometimes, you know, they're running track, they're lifting weight, Mm -hmm. they're doing things that possible hot warriors might have certain physical restrictions from doing. So I always tell parents to... Request a copy of the phys ed curriculum before the start of each school year. You have the curriculum sent to the cardiologist and pediatrician for review. If there's any questions about terminology, the parent needs to ask the phys ed teacher or the phys ed director for clarification. Mm-hmm. And then an individualized health care plan can be written to include the physical activities. Maybe the child cannot be playing contact sports or can't be lifting weights or shouldn't be doing sprints. Right. And have those included in the health care plan. And a child should not be having to sit on the sidelines to watch other students play sports, but other sports need to be offered that are equally appealing to the student and does not make the student feel left out. I think that's really important. If we can focus on giving our students alternatives that they still find acceptable, that's so much better than just letting them sit on the sidelines. And I know some school districts are very small and they probably have a more limited curriculum and offer a more limited number of sports, but it certainly would be nice to think that there would be something. Absolutely, and I totally agree with that. Yeah, and there's a lot of creative things that kids can do. 
you know, that, that keeps them active. Yes. And that's what I think is one of the greatest advantages to having an advocate is that the advocate all the time is being creative with parents and with students and with the schools because it's not an us against them. It's us working together as a team. And so it's nice that when you have an advocate, that's somebody who has been through the brainstorming process before and they've thought of alternatives that can be offered. They're also emotionally detached and having that person who can be more objective and view the situation more objectively, I think can oftentimes result in a much better outcome for the students. There's a lot of valuable input. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, we do need to take another quick break. Don't leave yet, folks, because when we come back, we're going to talk to Lisa a little bit more about those individualized health care plans. This is something that every heart warrior needs to have. So don't go away. We'll be right back. When I saw so many of these CHG groups growing, I found family just ready to join me. Anyone who is a member of the adult congenital heart defect community can be a guest on our show. We have a great year planned and we look forward to sharing other interesting topics. Heart to Heart with Nicole and David, serving the ACHD community, Wednesdays at noon Eastern. You are listening to Heart to Heart with Anna. If you have a question or comment that you would like addressed on our show, Please send an email to Anna Jaworski at Anna at hearttoheartwithanna.com. That's Anna at hearttoheartwithanna.com. Now, back to Heart to Heart with Anna. Welcome back to our show, Heart to Heart with Anna, a show for the congenital heart defect community. Today's show is special education accommodations and individualized health care plans. And Lisa has been awesome about telling us about specific kinds of accommodations that our students who are heart warriors may need in their regular classrooms. But we're going to talk more in this segment about individualized health care plans. So Lisa, tell us what this is and how we can get started with this. Healthcare plans are individualized to meet every child's needs, and a team of people come together, and it also includes the school, the parent, the cardiologist, the pediatrician, and a list is put together as to what the child's needs are mm -hmm. and also what the child's medical concerns are. And it isn't so much as putting out the child's diagnosis for everybody in the school to know about because that is private information, but it's more a list of if you see this, do that. Right. So if you see the child maybe needing to take a break during gym, mm -hmm. let them take a break. Mm -hmm. If you see a child maybe looks flush, send mm -hmm. them down to the nurse. Right. If the child is complaining they don't feel well, send them down to the nurse. Let the nurse take care of everything. Mm -hmm. The other thing that also needs to be taken into consideration on individual health care plans are also any type of physical limitations, mm -hmm. perhaps maybe in phys ed class. Right. Or maybe going from classroom to classroom, they might need more time. And another thing always to look at is the high school science curriculum, mm. where sometimes kids are doing either biology or chemistry. Mm -hmm. And you want to reduce any potential for infection. So all students should be wearing rubber gloves and eye goggles. It's even more so important that a heart warrior also has access to those things and not be singled out like where that child's the only one in the classroom wearing rubber gloves during right. an experiment. Have everybody in the classroom be wearing rubber gloves. So it's just, right. you know, frequent hand washing, things mm -hmm. like that. And another thing is on field trips, if it's advantageous for a nurse to attend a field trip, school nurse can go and a substitute nurse can be called into the building for coverage. Mm -hmm. Or perhaps parents should go on field trips. Mm -hmm. Just in case there's any medical emergencies, the parent's already there. Right. The parent knows what the protocol mm -hmm. is. Another thing is a lot of times kids might be wearing the medical ID mm -hmm. bracelets or, or necklaces, and that needs to be included because sometimes there might be a class. If you have a high mm -hmm. school student maybe working around a metal fab shop or something where they say no no jewelry, but if you have a child that's wearing a medical alert ID, they need to be keeping that particular jewelry on them. Well, could they maybe just move it to their belt or something so it's... Well, so I was going to say, if it's, if it's a necklace, mm -hmm. maybe, if it's a necklace they wear, maybe change it to something on their wrist, something that's more right. attached to their body that's not going to get caught in a piece of machinery. Right, right. And another good thing to have on the individual health care plans is where the defibrillators are located in the building, oh, yeah. so everybody knows, mm -hmm. and to also make sure that there are a lot of people in the building that are trained on first aid and how to use defibrillators. 
Yeah. And lastly, very important is when, when you develop the individual health care plan is to include a photo with the child mm -hmm. on every copy, a clear photo, for easy identification purposes, especially at the beginning of a school year mm -hmm. or if there's substitute teachers that come in any time right. during the school year yeah. so they can identify the child. Mm -hmm. When if you have a heart condition, it's an invisible thing. Nobody can see it. Exactly. Those documents are also private documents. They should be kept in substitute folders and not posted on classroom walls for everybody mm -hmm. to see. Right, right, because we do care about HIPAA laws. We do care about their privacy. However, I know that sometimes student teachers come in and are working with teachers. They need to know that as well, especially if they're being moved to independence and the regular classroom teacher isn't in that room and it's only the student teacher because they're trying to learn how to become a teacher. Everybody needs to know who's going to have contact with that student, especially if they're not going to be with the regular people, like you said, when there's a substitute or something like that. So I know that a couple of my friends who went to high schools that had multiple levels, that they were given access to the elevator instead of having to go up and down the stairs. So that's another kind of accommodation that may be given to them. And that's one of the advantages to having an advocate working with you is that they can scope out the building and they can see what kind of accommodations may be needed that you wouldn't even really think about. Well, sometimes it might be access to water all the time or yeah. even have an air conditioning or a fan close by because sometimes the older schools are not air conditioned. Right. I mean, you don't want a child, you know, to overheat. Mm. It's important, you know, not only are you sharing the documentation with student teachers, but there's also music teachers, right. art teachers, and then you also have specialists that might work with the child, maybe a special ed teacher or a speech therapist, OT, PT. Yep. Mm -hmm. And then you have recess aides and lunch aides and bus drivers and school bus monitors right. and even the administrators, well, even the custodians. You want everybody to be aware that this is the child. This is, you see this, you do that. Mm -hmm. These are what the accommodations are because you don't want to leave any room for error. But it's very important for parents to give permission to the school to share this documentation with specialists mm -hmm. and with the bus driver and the lunch aides and people like that because due to HIPAA law, a lot of times these documents are not shared with people that the specialists that come in. You know, there's a fine line between the IEP personnel and school personnel. That's true. And when you think about it, some of our kids have study halls or we don't like to think of this, but some of our children may be naughty and have to go to detention. They may be with somebody who doesn't know. So you're right. They do need to be made aware. Right. I think you have to really work hard to be an advocate and to make sure things are known. Here's one of the problems that I'm sure you have faced, Lisa, is that once kids hit those teenage years, all of a sudden, they just want to be like everybody else. They don't want everybody knowing that they have special considerations. How do you deal with that, Lisa? As a parent going into a meeting or as an advocate going into a meeting and you have a 15-year-old sitting at the meeting with you because after age 14, they have to be in the meetings with you, you just have to stress with them the importance of letting school personnel know that you have a heart condition. Nobody's going to make you feel any differently, mm -hmm. or they shouldn't be, or if they do make you feel differently, speak up and, and advocate for yourself and say, hey, you're singling me out. But it's very, very important to share that information with those around you so in case of an emergency, people are aware that there's an issue, an underlying issue. Right. I think that's really important. I get upset when I see parents who say they want their children to be treated like everyone else, and so they withhold information, especially when the kids are going into kindergarten, because they think, oh, it's just half a day. It's not a problem. It could be a problem. And so I really encourage parents from the get-go to let the teachers know and to let the administrators know that this child has had open-heart surgery. Well, I think you should always make people aware, even if you have allergies, like if you have peanut allergy or allergic to bee stings or mm -hmm. anything, or if you're a diabetic, all those things, that yeah. you need to let people aware in case of an emergency. God forbid anything happens, you wouldn't want school district or even a summer camp not to know that there's a potential, and you certainly don't want your child to be treated any differently, and you can stress that as well. As a parent, you should still be willing to share that information with professionals. You know, just give everybody a heads up. And it's always good to do it in writing because you never want anybody to say, well, I didn't know. Right. I didn't know. Mm -hmm. And at that point, it's too late. Yeah. 
Right, right. I agree. Well, the last question I have for you, Lisa, is as a special education advocate, what advice can you offer parents if they're having difficulty getting those accommodations or getting the individualized health care plan for their child to be implemented? We always tell parents to work their way up the totem pole. So if you start with the teachers, and from there you can go to the assistant principal, then to the principal, then to the assistant superintendent, then to the superintendent. You can always take it to the school board. Every state has a department of education, Mm -hmm. and they always have a department of special education. And you just work your way up the totem pole, because the bottom line is the child has medical needs or a child has special needs. The child needs accommodations and plans in place to make them successful and put them on a level playing field. And the plans need to be implemented Mm -hmm. for the child to be successful. So if plans are not being implemented as agreed to, you just have to work your way up the totem pole and those plans need to be implemented. Right. You can always inquire with a smile and and be nice. And and you don't have to be angry with schools. You always want to collaborate with them and, and have everybody work together because the bottom line is you want a positive outcome for your child. Right. We all want everybody to succeed. And I'll tell you, as a former special education teacher, it was my goal for every student to succeed. And I wanted my children to be successful. So friendly reminders, if I was forgetting something, were always welcome because I wanted that parent to be part of the team. And if they knew that I had forgotten something, that meant that they were keeping up with it. And hopefully they were doing their part with the child as well, because it really does take a team approach for anybody to be successful. And parents can always reach out to teachers with emails, and that way their teachers can respond to emails when they have time in the day to do so. Right, yeah. Or even a text message if your teacher is sharing his or her phone number with you. It seems like nowadays, especially, there are multiple ways to reach out to people. And so you want to start in the classroom if you're noticing any problems. You don't want to immediately call the superintendent. Really, you're all on the same team. Yes, absolutely. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show, Lisa. I think this is really helpful. Like we said, everybody's gearing up in the United States to go back to school. And so these are the kinds of issues that they may need to revisit. Well, thank you so much for having me, Anna. I really appreciate you allowing me to share my knowledge with parents. Well, thanks again, Lisa, and thank you for listening today. Please come back next week on Tuesday at noon Eastern Time. Until then, please find and follow our podcast on YouTube. And remember, my friends, you are not alone. Heart to Heart with Anna is a presentation of Hearts Unite the Globe and is part of the Hug Podcast Network. Hearts Unite the Globe is a nonprofit organization devoted to providing resources to the congenital heart defect community to uplift, empower, and enrich the lives of our community members. If you would like access to free resources pertaining to the CHD community, please visit our website at www.congenitalheartdefects.com for information about CHD, the hospitals that treat children with CHD, summer camps for CHD survivors, and much, much more. Thank you again for joining us this week. We hope you have been inspired and empowered to become an advocate for the congenital heart defect community. Heart to Heart with Anna, with your host Anna Jaworski, can be heard every Tuesday at 12 noon Eastern Time.